What's up guys, this is Characters, welcome back to How to Master 6 Max Zoom. Um, this is episode number 6, I think, and I've got my friend and student Rory with me today. How's it going, man? Good, thanks. So we are going to do a bit of a bit of live play. We had Rory on a podcast um, not long ago. First video you've done, right? Yep. Yep, first video for Grinder School. So we're... Um, current game that you're playing is 50NL Zoom, so we've been doing a load of work on your game um, for that over the last couple of months or whatnot. And the idea of today's video is I want to show you guys what um, Rory's study plan actually looks like so we can see like how he's actually um, approaching learning, like what different things are relevant for learning 6Max Zoom, and what, how is a week in the life of the 6Max grinder, how is his study time divided basically. So we've got your super baller study plan here today, have you found it? To, has it turned you into a super baller? Uh, not yet. Not yet. Well, no. I guess there's like a get a grace period. It will happen. I hope. Um, yes. I'll play super baller. Super baller. So week one, um, we have laid out a few different things. So let's talk about. Let's start from the top, man. Go for it. What's the first one all about? Yeah. So it's just a. Um, so we decided uh, quite a while ago that people just um, don't balance their ranges properly when they're checking on the flop. Yeah. Um, most of they're just going to have air uh, and a, a larger proportion than they should have. So uh, just to, to look for more spots where I can just pick up pots easily, um, be it with people have folding out hands with equity against my hand or yeah. Um, or just picking up the pot with air. So yeah, just to clarify, this is spots where someone has opened and then they've checked the flop as the preflop raiser. Obviously, yeah. if they check as preflop caller, it's like a range check and it doesn't mean that they have air all the time. But yeah. people aren't check calling the flop enough. They're not check, check raising the flop really as the preflop raiser. I mean, they're doing it sometimes. They're doing it more than they used to. They, you probably find that they do it more at 50 and zoom than they do at 25. Um, but Yeah, they, you can definitely see like the, the better players uh, are obviously checked they have a, a more, even if you just look at their basic stats of check call, check raise, check call, they definitely have higher check call and check definitely. call rates, ranges than uh, yep. most of their fish, uh, for yeah, sure. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, this is the kind of thing where we will actually, like usually we'd be balanced in a spot if we didn't know that there was a higher EV alternative. But here, because we think the population does overfold their range here, we're going to just start off by being exploitative and we're going to stab more to flop checks from the preflop raiser then would be balanced, and there are a few advantages of this. Um, like, how does that actually gain you EV? Um, so the 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 obvious uh, thing is just by having them fold, which like yeah. making a pot is going to give me EV. Um, regardless yeah. of what hands I have, another the other exploitative adjustment you can make is if you have a nutty hand, you can just check back a little mm -hmm. bit more. Um, yeah, definitely. Like, especially if it's a texture that they're always folding on. Like, I yeah. find that people just don't check call textures like 8, 6, 5, 2 tone, things like that. I feel like they just check fold enormous amounts when they check. So maybe there, if you flop, like, the straight with the flush draw, you can check back a straight and let yeah. them delayed see. But just extreme things like that that we'd never normally do if we weren't sure that the population was really unbalanced here. And I think you do need to be a bit careful with things like that on wet boards, like just checking back. You need to be sure that they are check folding a huge amount before you do that, otherwise you're just costing yourself three streets of value potentially. Um, and it's also the early streets that you want to bet on a wet board generally, if you're going to prioritize one street over another, you'd favor the earlier streets. Um, but yeah, anyway, so this is good. This is one of the things that is on your core technical game, which is actually the nuts and bolts of your out of game understanding. Um, Zoom is very like fast paced and it's not enough just to work on your core technical game out of game, why not? Um, so an issue I've particularly struggled with is the um, uh, when I just if you rush decisions in Zoom, you can end up making a lot of mistakes very quickly. Uh, they add up very quickly in Zoom. Absolutely, uh, especially, especially if you're four tabling. So given we have less time to act, then if we just sat and you know designed range charts and talked about every spot in depth for like thirty minutes in our coaching sessions, what would be the problem? Uh, so like there'd be a massive gap, then you don't have. The the last the last time you have there's just a difference between the amount of time you get to analyze the spot. So yeah, you can try and narrow the difference between your away of the table analysts and your in game play. Uh, you'll be more likely to retain what you actually learned away from the table and use it in play. Yeah, that's it. It's twofold. One, you need to actually apply the stuff you learn away from the table to 
cement it as properly learnt by your subconscious. And secondly, like there's this huge time deficit, like you say, it's going to be really difficult for us to um, use the same depth and clarity of thought process as we can out of game in an in-game context. So that's why we do things like gap closers. Um, gap closers are can take various forms. Like one of them here, the is a speed review. Um, how does that work? Uh, so it's just we look at a or we'll pick a hand, and instead of doing it like a detailed analysis, which might take five to ten minutes, um, and yeah just to give yourself 20 seconds and think about the spot uh, away from the table and think what the, the best play would be. And then when it comes to the, the game, you'll get a similar time. So I hope yeah. you can retain the this logic, the train of logic. In, Absolutely. In so it's like in game, there's time and monetary pressure. Out yeah. of game, there's neither. But if you create time pressure, like you're not going to actually start wagering with your coach on whether you get things right. That could work, actually. That's an innovative idea. I start betting you dollars whether you make the, the right call, but then I'll just tell you you're wrong so I can take your money, so maybe it wouldn't work. Um, but anyway, you can create the monetary strain, yeah. uh, the, the time strain, even if you can't can create the monetary strain out of game, and that does like a little bit to bridging that gap, for sure. I actually used to bet on, uh, with my golf coach, I used to bet on certain things to add the, the monetary pressure. That's good, that's cool, yeah. Uh, so... It might be something worth thinking about, but I I think there's enough gambling involved in poker. I, I also think poker is really subjective. So while your golf coach and you are going to agree fully on whether the ball went in the hole, yeah, you're yeah. not. We aren't mean you and I may not agree on whether you've come to the right decision in a spot. And I could yeah. probably use my my coaching blagging abilities to convince yeah. you that you were wrong, even if you weren't, to try and take your money. So I don't know how ethical that would be or how regulated it would be. <laughs> We could get a judge, an independent adjudicator, like another coach or something, I suppose. Interesting, anyway. I like the idea, in theory. Um, anyway, back to learning. Um, so I think that the speed reviews are just totally necessary. There's something I started doing with students recently, like in the last couple of months. I never really thought of this before. I came up with this a couple of months ago. I've been doing it loads, and it's been working wonders. I really think it's great for bridging the gap. So if you guys want to try this at home, basically you select a batch of hands, <clears throat> and... You basically just, should we do an example of one now actually, just to show everyone? We'll just pick a hand and we'll speed review yeah, it. Sure. Um, we're doing this, we're kind of winging this session a little bit on the fly. We haven't completely decided on the structure of it, but sometimes the best coaching sessions are the ones that you don't plan out exactly what you're going to do. Um, yeah. You go with the flow. So just pick a hand, like any hand. These are, are these any particular filter? Uh, so these are floating flops. Okay, just pick one of those then and we'll. Do a speed review on a floating Mark flop them. spot. Unmark them. Uh, okay, we'll go here. So the way I would do this with a student is I'd say, right, what are the things we need to consider before we float flop? And I'd do a little bit of theory brush up first. So how do we approach floating the flop then in general? What factors are we thinking about? Um, so we're, we're looking at uh, whether or not we think he's likely to give up on later streets, how likely we are to realise our equity with yeah. the hand, um, as well as our equity against his range, um, and then just how often we think we're going to win the pot. Yeah, so um, that's in a vacuum. If we were constructing a range to flow in, in like a long-term strategy, how would we do that? So we want to look at how many value hands we're going to be just calling the flop with. Yeah. Uh, we won't be giving up on later streets, so then we... We want to construct a folding range on the turn two so that our opponent doesn't just have an incentive to just check fold all his air on the turn. Yeah, to one and done. Because if we were only, you know, if we were only flatting flop with hands we were planning on calling turn with, and fish do this all the time, and that's why they're terrible, and that's why we can exploit them. You know, they call flop on eight four four. They're not folding the five turn ever. There's no yeah. part of their range that's folding it, and therefore hero just has a very easy time giving up with all the c bets that didn't work and just making a lot of money. Sounds weird to say hero makes money by giving up, but he really does. Um, he's exploiting Villain. He shouldn't have that easier route to stop bluffing. Whereas if we are balanced, then Villain can't just like one and done and print lots of money against us, basically. So let's let's go for it. So now I would say let's go to the flop and we'd skip forward to the flop. This is how the speed review would work. We start at the spot we look at. We wait till Villain bets. So we say, let me see Villain's bet. Uh, actually, so I think uh, this might actually be against the Missy, but uh, I think it's just mistagged. <laughs> right, okay, right, okay. that was kind of like a build-up for yep. the wrong situation. So now we're going to pretend then that Villain bet $2, right? I'm going to like yep. mentally shift that $2 bet over to Villain, and we're going to like go from there. So Villain's bet $2, you're deciding whether or not to float sixes, and then I'm going to say 20 seconds. So I might even bring up like a, 
I don't have a stopwatch to hand right now, but I would, I'm going to get an app basically I can stick on screen. Um, but anyway, 20 seconds, go. Um, so I think uh, it's actually be worth considering folding in this particular spot. Um, he actually has pretty high uh, turn and river sea bets that. So he, he um, we basically don't like any, or we don't like a lot of turns. <coughs> uh, we don't like any over cards. We yeah. only really like four, five, or six. Um, and we're just not going to get to realize our equity very often. He'll okay. be able to barrel us off with a lot of cards. 20 uh, seconds is up, I think. Yeah. Um, that was good. Like, that was really quick, right? We didn't get much time there to think at all. But, yeah, Rory was still able to come to a decision, justify the decision based on relevant factors. I would also add to that the villain's under the gun, you know, and he's yeah. just got a stronger range anyway. So folding this flop is definitely reasonable. It equates to folding a lot, but I'd probably rather float this flop by a mile with, like, ace-queen with ace of spades than I would sixes, for sure. Yeah. Or even king-queen with the king of spades is probably a better call here. Even fours are better than sixes, and that a lot more turns give us strike draws, I yep. guess. Um, or they give us better strike draws as yeah, well. Yeah, we get more open-enders, so fours is probably better than sixes, yeah. Probably doesn't make a great deal of difference showdown value-wise. Okay, so that's how we do a speed review. Let's go back to your learning plan. I'll just talk through the other things that I recommend for someone playing 50 and Zoom right now. I'd also like to just point out that we've done a lot of work out of game on your overall understanding and that's why at this point we're like six weeks into our coaching that's why we're shifting now to talk more about in-game to bridge the gap like i won't do this with a new student if there's someone who doesn't have a very good foundation out of game we're not we're never going to sit here and do speed reviews because he's just going to think ridiculous thoughts it's only because i've trained you already or we've worked together i should say to get your out of game um, ability up and it's now at a level that i'm pretty confident can beat 50 nl zoom that we're actually bothering to close the gap now you need the foundation in place before you close the gap in coaching for sure so all right so number th the third one there then one hour yeah. review per pre-recorded 30 minute video have you done this yet yeah how did you go on with that yeah so it was interesting um the the main thing you obviously notice um so things you don't really notice in game if you like you might to sort of auto open like a side suit under the gun or something like that, and then you're looking back and you're like, oh, there's four or five aggressive rags behind me. Why am I opening so wide under the gun? I'm just gonna get pummeled. Um, or that's probably a side is probably even a bad example, but even something like ace ten off that's at the very bottom of our opening range, yeah. which we should probably just consider falling if yeah. we've only got tough opponents behind us. So we're spotting things that we just don't even notice. They go right over our head in game, and we're picking out recurring leaks that we actually that we have and um, fixing them basically yeah that's pretty much the idea it's again it's gap closing it's thinking about what do i do in game that i should never be doing basically um regularly yeah so it's a good idea Re pre record your sessions then watch them back you'll be amazed how much stuff you do that you just think is oh that's actually really bad and how much stuff you do with regularity moreover Okay, the one after that we've not done yet. We're going to detailed review of constructing turn and river power ranges, followed by speed review per spot. So here, like I think we, this is all about red line, like winning more pots, and again, it's about gap closing, about doing something out of game and then applying it in a more in-game, fast-paced environment, um, even though it's not live play. So we discovered when we tried to do this, right, that if you actually did it combo by combo, it would take you obscene amounts of time to even review one hand. Yeah. So... Uh how do we get around that then? So if we just look at the sort of type of types of hands rather than specific combos, right? Um, and then you can you can make uh, sort of more general general assumptions rather than yeah. I have like second pair or whatever it is, and I've got forty combos of second pair, and you can make a decision on how you want to split like your your combos then. Um, in terms of like where you draw the lines rather than just going hand by hand and yeah. pick, picking a hand and putting in. Yeah, you so, want to work on the thought process. You want to work on being able to actually wing it on the fly in game, like sit there and actually be like, right, how much, how many combos roughly or how big a range am I actually getting to this turn with? What parts of that am I betting for value? And out of the, the rest, what's the most suitable to bluff and what ratio do I need? That sounds like a lot to do in game. But the more you practice out of game, the more you can do it. Whereas if you sit there and actually get your chart and work out exactly what you do with every combo, I'm not saying there's never a time and a place for that, and it is instructive to do it sometimes, but it's not in-game. It's not gap closing at all. It's more about forming the theoretical understanding in the first place. So when you're doing gap closing, 
you very much want to focus on something that's at least a little bit um, resembles an, an in-game thought process with those constraints. Okay, going down, this is where I got lazy and I didn't want to give you lots of 30 minute ones because I'd have to think up like loads more so I started giving you hour ones, you see? This is how, how it goes. Um, no, not really, I just figured like, you know, like there's actually a lot of bulk to these and you can't sit down and spend half an hour on your mental game because you're just not going to get that much done basically. Um, oh, yeah. But it's, I've actually spent a lot, like, generally when it says one hour, I'd probably go over, like... Yeah, for sure, every definitely. Every single time. And these don't have to be exact. We're not saying, like, you need to time these when you do a learning document like this. It's just a guideline. So whether it takes you longer or shorter is not really a big deal. It's just roughly how long I estimate it's going to take. Um, so mental game work. Make a document of the following format. List what you honestly think of the three biggest irrational recurring thoughts, so types of tilt that come up on a regular basis. And this process, we just looked at this in a coaching session earlier. And do you want to just talk through like why this is important for you to do right now and how it's going to go? Yeah, so I'm on a pretty reasonable downswing at the minute, and uh, second guessing myself a lot and going on tilt quite a bit. So it's quite important for me to address the tilt issue uh, and try to get closer to playing my A game and just getting better at accepting variants, yeah. um, especially given that. The variance is so high in the game, so I'm choosing to play. Absolutely, very high choice, high variance choice of game. Like I said at the beginning of this series, not for the the variance faint hearted. I would say. Um, so, what's the logic to this then? Why are we thinking about a cause, recognition, why it's irrational, and then how to treat it? Like, what's the progression here? So, when you when we pick the or when we rec when you acknowledge your your mistakes or what your your the mistake you're making. Uh, then in the future, hopefully, and then by labeling it with irrational thoughts and uh, then giving the, the short, witty statements, you can think of the short, witty statements when you realize that the, it's happening again in the future and you can recognize why it's a mistake and why it's stupid and you can get over it easier. Yeah, so it's a way of like training your subconscious. It's very much like ripped off from Jared Tenler's The Mental Game of Poker, where he comes up with logical injections. I call them witty short statements just to rip them off. Um, but that's basically what they are. Um, this is very much me following the teachings of that excellent book, which I definitely recommend that everyone checks out, and The Mental Game of Poker by Jared Tendler. Anyway, um, so his procedure is basically follows this kind of roadmap. If you don't know the cause, then it's going to be impossible to actually figure out why it's happening and stop it from happening. So we need to think about what causes it. We need to think about what how, how you can recognize it as well. Because if you don't know when it's happening, you don't know the symptoms, then you won't be aware of it. If you're not aware of it, you can't treat it. So it's all about gaining mindfulness and awareness of what's actually happening in your head, detaching yourself from that and saying, this is happening and it's irrational and I don't have to succumb to it. And then actually summarizing in one to three little statements, you've got options here for each one, what we're going to do. Can we give an example, actually, of one of the tilts that you've worked on? Yeah, um... So the the main sorry I can actually just open up the document. Yeah, go for it. Just open up your mental game document. Mm -hmm. So what you're seeing right now is very much something that would we're basically following the roadmap of a coaching session, like where we're checking up on his um, on Rory's study plan, and then we're going over. We're just like sort of going over his work and seeing how he's done. But I'm just sort of mapping it out for you, for you guys watching on Grinder School. So this is very close to like what a coaching session could be like, basically, just with us talking to you guys as the third person. Anyway, so beat up fear, this is a good one. Explain that then, what's that? Um, so it's when your your uh, subconscious is sort of taking on the recent history to make suboptimal decisions because you, uh, you basically are assigning people way too strong or way too weak a range and you think either you're getting over bluffed or uh, you're not, you're not you're running into nuts too much or you're not gonna get called by worse. Um the so the, the best example would be if you have like the third nuts on the river and your option between raising and you know if he has anything better than the tenth nuts he's gonna call you. So there's seven hands that you beat or six hands you beat and two hands you lose to, it's an obvious value show. Yep. Um Whereas if you're after on a downswing like I am at the minute, you're less likely to make the correct decision in raising and you, you're more likely to just call because you're afraid of running into them. Yeah. Two hands that beat you. Good. So we've got like, what is it? It's a fear of being cooler or sucked out on based on recent events. The mind likes to 
think that if something's happened before, it's going to continue happening, like right now in Scotland. Don't know if it's the same for you over in Ireland, but it's rained like every day for the past like month, basically. Um, you experience that as well? Uh, yeah, it's pissing around at the minute. Yeah, it's pissing here as well. Um, so basically when it does that, like we just think it's, we expect it to rain every day. And when it's sunny, it's like, whoa, holy shit, what's happening? And it's the same in poker. When you're running really, really bad, then you suddenly win a pot. It's almost like, whoa, I just won it. I wasn't expecting that, you know? Um, so we irrationally expect things to continue just for no other reason than we like to find patterns. So this is a, that's what causes this, basically. How do we get rid of it? Well, let's look at D. Um, I can criticize parts of this, right? What am I going to criticize here based on our last coaching session? Uh, so the negative aspect of my witty statement. Yeah, so your witty statements are too negative. You don't want to beat yourself up because that's the very thing. It's because you've been beat up that this is happening. So beating yourself up more is not going to fix it. What you need to do is frame the potential gain that you can actually get by diffusing this kind of tilt and just saying something more to the more to the effect of um, but we, well, you take your deep breath, you sit back, then you inject your logic and your logic could be something like, well, I need to do what's most plus EV at all times. That's money. EV equals money. Fear does not. Following EV makes money. Following fear does not. Something like that. Just a snappy little thing that you can inject and then you can go ahead and click the right button as opposed to the wrong one because you've given yourself that little breather. So we'd probably go, go ahead and um, improvise this. We'd get rid of the... You don't want to be sat there going wrong at yourself at the table because it's just going to make yourself mad, right? Like if anyone did that in my face when I was tilted, I would become more tilted. So even if that person was me, I'd still become more tilted if I was saying that to myself. So... Do you know what, like, true story, like, when I used to first start playing poker, I'd play, like, I'd get, like, drunk and I'd get really angry, like, I was, like, a total mental game fish and, like, I'd actually, like, make a bad call and I'd, like, smack myself in the face, I'd, like, actually, like, punch myself in the face. Like, not super hard, but hard enough to, you know, it would hurt and I'd feel even madder, that would make me feel better. So, like, a long time ago, you know, lessons learned, but definitely be positive and don't be hard on yourself, because we're all mental game fish and we all have to start somewhere with the mental game of poker and it's normal to suck at that aspect. Right, let's go back to the study plan. Okay. Uh, yeah. Focus session with commentary. I think we all know what focus session is by now if you've been watching my videos for any length of time. It's when you play less tables. Again, with the idea of closing the gap between out of game and in game, I'm all about bridging these two thought processes in my coaching. I think it's very, very important and underrated by most coaches. Um, so this is where we record and speak to ourselves and you're actually like sharing these on the study group as well, right? Yeah, so I shared this one or the one I did. Um, actually, took me two goals. I forgot to record my commentary for a spell, but uh, the yeah, I shared it on the study group uh, and just talking through uh, every, or as many spots as I think is necessary. Uh, obviously, skipping something obvious like opening aces yeah. on the button or true betting aces. Or yeah, and there's nothing worse than that cringy video where the instructor's like gonna open aces on the button because it's standard it's like why did you even say that you know um yeah. exactly totally um so this is all about like the more you if you're speaking you're under pressure to think more quickly and more clearly because you know that people are gonna actually watch your video this is going on a study group where there's like 55 members and they're all gonna sit or some of them are gonna sit and watch through it so you don't want to sound like an idiot so you don't want to have idiot thoughts when you're playing so it's gonna teach you to be more strict with the thoughts that you think because those thoughts are coming out of your mouth and they're, you're accountable for them because people are actually listening. It's like you would stay at home in your pyjamas and there'd be no problem with that, but you wouldn't wear your pyjamas to, to court because people are going to judge you for that. So it's a way of, if you wanted to spruce up your appearance in the house, that would be a good way to do it. It would be to like, this is a ridiculous analogy, I'm just going to like shut up about it like right now because it's just getting out of hand. But you get the point, right? It's all about accountability basically and training yourself to be more accountable even when you're on your own and you're not recording just to be that accountable all the time yep okay next floating the flop um long review followed by speed review again just bridging the gap we're about to get onto that at the end of our coaching session before we run out of time we'll get to that later <laughs> these are all things that rory's going to do on his own these are not things that like i have to be there for but i will check them and i will go over them and make sure that they're okay and stuff like that right let's play some poker Okay. Um, okay. That's the beauty of Zoom. It's like, hey, let's play some poker, man. And he's like, all right, one second, and we're in. There we go. 
Like, oh. You've got to love Zoom. Like, how can it not be your game of choice? Apart from the horrendously torturous variants, I mean, you've got to love it. Sometimes. Sometimes you love it. Like you were saying earlier, when you have those 20 buy-in sessions, like, where else can you have a t- plus 20 buy-in session other than Zoom? That is true. And, um... So in-game thought process, I just want you to speak um, yeah. as you would if you were recording this session. I'll give you feedback. Okay, so just do a week to three bet, I guess. Um, yeah. Yeah, if we're three bet and queen nine suited, I think it's like we're making a, an over bluffy kind of linear range in the small blind that's just got a lot of weak hands in it, and you'd only want to do that if someone's folding a lot to three bets. We don't know that yet. So. Um, How is it possible to be this card dead when you're playing Zoom? I mean, come on. Well, that's me for the last two weeks. Two weeks. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know how I haven't even been seen one flop, I don't think, but okay. It's going to happen. It's because we're recording. It's the curse of the video maker. Um, so again, Jack 10 off. I think it's just two weak. Uh, he's 37, three over. Yeah, so what kind of range do we want to three bet there? Uh, pretty nutty and polarized, or er, well, just nuts, I think. Yeah, linear yeah. and nutty. Uh. And then four bit bluffing range there, table three. On King Jack Golf, um, yeah, it's definitely worth considering. Uh, as looking at the other two tables at the same time, mm-hmm. probably didn't help. How wide a four bit range would we be bluffing if we did bluff King Jack off? Very. Yes, yeah, so um, pretty wide. Not yeah. hugely wide, but definitely like more wide than would be balanced. I would think because we've got like Ace Jack King Queen there for a start. Which is a lot of combos right away to use as a bluff. Uh, so nine ten off. I think like it's if we're defending nine ten off, we've got a lot better suited. Options. We are deep here though, and this is like much better to be deep with a hand like this. Um, the stack sizes do favour us for sure. So I think this might just about be a call. Okay. Close though. Uh, like I definitely fold it if we were just like normal stack depth, but our positional advantage is much better when we're deep, much more enhanced, and our implied odds are a lot better and stuff like that. Um, and so they see about the size, like, um, it's a pretty easy fold. Yeah, we don't need to defend very much of our range at all there. And also, when we've got more implied odds, we can probably even defend, like, less of our range than normal because we're just making all that money by calling pre-flop anyway the times we hit. So just because, like, it may... I'm not saying we should overfold our range there, but even if we were overfolding our range, that wouldn't make the pre-flop call bad because of the extra implied odds the times we do call flop. So, so you're yeah. impressed with my run bad so far over like 10 hands? Yeah, you're running pretty awful, man. I'd maybe quit the game and just take up, like, go back to golf. I would if I could. Would you actually quit poker if you were, like, if the injury was better and you could play golf? Uh, I don't really. I think it's it's feasible to play both properly at the no. same time. Uh, it no. would be the issue. Or, well, definitely not if I had to work as well. Then that's just not an option. Uh too much practice needed and yeah. yeah it's like I've got all these hobbies like I love playing like League of Legends I love playing Bridge I love playing chess I love playing poker but it's just like okay I don't actually love playing poker that's a lie but I will play poker to make money um, but you know it's just so there's not enough time for all the geeky like hobbies in the world other it's just if you want to be really geeky about something get into it fully it just takes so much time um, so this is close because the big blind is pretty aggressive true better uh, I think I might actually just fall yeah like it yeah, he's he's a uh, super aggressive tree better. Uh, tree betting isn't really ideal either. We don't have any blockers, or uh, it's not really a good hand to tree bet. I don't think. I agree uh, with your analysis, hundred percent. Good. So now I feel super nitty because I haven't had a hand in like ten minutes. And yeah, I what's what your hand looks like? You're probably running like nine four here. Just goes to show though that you know you can actually run like that even if you're like a normal. I don't know what you normally run. Like twenty three. Yeah. <laughs> no, what's your What's your HUD right now? Can you see it or do you not have it available? Uh, no, I don't. I don't show up my own HUD because enough, uh, I want to avoid like sort of like this. If I'm running bad, like if I was nine three, I'm like, oh, I'm just being a net. Yeah, uh, but you're not at all. You're playing like the same default opening ranges you'd always play. So, yeah. Yeah, and like. If, like I feel like you'll end up just making a, a lot of mistakes to try and adjust your HUD to what you think it should yeah, be. Yeah, which is ridiculous. Like the HUD describes how you play. You don't base your play off your HUD. You know, that's just absurd. 
Uh, and anyway, like you, you can't. I don't think in in Zoom it gives a very fair. If you were to look at your sessions, that's like you, you don't know which hands they played against you. Like you could be a hundred on yeah. their stuff. Uh, so it's not really useful. I don't think you're on with. No, I'm getting some delays with the screen there. I think it's coming back, but I just had a weird lag. I never get that over Skype as well. Maybe it's just the it's yeah. curse of the video maker. See, because we're making a video right now, getting like this horrible lag. And this horrible rumba. Can you stop sharing and just reshare your screen with me? Because it's pretty bad. Yeah, give me a second. Uh, I'll just set up these hands. Uh, can you see I do serve? Yeah, I can, uh, but it's not moving. It's just sort of stuck pre flop. Okay. Uh, I did fix it out, I found. Uh, bold. What we'll do is we'll just like pause the video. Um, for a second while we resolve this problem guys and then we'll be right back for another sort of five ten minutes or another ten minutes ten fifteen minutes of live play okay and we're back i think the problem's been resolved hopefully the recorder starting up again doesn't recause it should be all good so i just said that we should flat eight seven off to a fish min open there off camera and that's because like a fish is just going to play really bad and we're just getting such great implied odds like implied odds okay you might argue eight seven off is not a good implied odds hand it's not great but when your price is one big blind then you're 100 deep i'd open that okay then so the, sorry i had the, the button was mistagged so it was effectively out of position to three regs that ah, okay I had three back percentage. Oh, okay fair enough um was that uh i was thinking about it for a minute uh it's close then it was a big uh probably yeah so eight seven off i think it's a call when a fisherman opens a button even against a reg it's a call as well i think just about but especially against a fish because you just have way more implied odds they're going to make more mistakes um so this this fish uh is a short stack and he has a pretty high tree rep percentage so i think they're just going to fold uh, there's not really that much implied odds against no, him. no I'm definitely not i'd always fold here your hand just sucks to play out of position with no initiative and yeah it's just minus ev have we see have I seen about one flop? I don't think so. I don't think you've actually been been dealt anything better than like King Ten pre flop. I really no. don't think you have. You've been dealt fives, you've been dealt King Ten, that's about it. This is like oh. the worst oh there we go. One of the aces. Got a net in the blind here. Oh there we go. I'm gonna get four bit bluff by this moron reg and we're gonna shove over him. That's how it goes. I shouldn't just disrespect the population for no reason whatsoever. It's like you no. are a moron because you have a picture of a lion and it tilts me. Yeah, Fair enough, though. See? Do you know what tilts me? That avatar with the two faces. You see that one to the left of the lion? No. No, it was really tilty. It was like that woman that's got like two eyes, two noses, two mouths, and it just like boggles your head. Avatars like that are just designed to tilt you. It's horrible. So I think if this was King 9 suit, I'd definitely true back. I yeah. No, no point in the opposite. It's no. just going to be, I'm just going to be true back bluffing way too much. Exactly. Um, Even if you go small size in there, you're still probably just way too wide there if you use King 9 off. <clears throat> Queen Town so hopefully I get to defend that. Um, There's an open. Let's open it. Yeah, I think I can defend the Queen yeah, Town suit. It'll be fine. And not a great flop, so I'm just going to check falls. Yep. Um, what would you say if I was like, if you were teaching me and I said, but you can't just call and then fold a flop, that's so weak? Well, like, you're going to have to fold some hands and you don't fold <laughs> yeah. some. Uh, <laughs> It's too easy. Uh, so the reason I see about here is I have the back rush right and flush out. So I also block block King Jack and King Ten, yep. uh, which would be the top of this power lifting guy's range. Uh, he should have King Queen too. Uh, he's probably true betting Ace King, so it's pretty close to the top of his. One also, if range. he's sat there just power lifting, he's probably not even going to make it back to his computer in time to click a button. So we should just see bet and hope he times out, right? True. He's probably well, just going like, to drop the weight on his toes. Actually, I noticed in your video yesterday, or I saw you had him tagged as a weak player, and he's actually, he's actually, I think he's one of the bigger winners in my sample. Really? <laughs> yeah, uh, he's actually pretty decent, I think. I had him tagged as a, as a fish. Yeah, yeah you had a I think you had him tagged as like a passive fish, and he has like a 12% true bag <laughs> uh, over like a 2K sample, too. Uh, well, maybe my sample of like 35 hands was more accurate. Did you ever think of that? Possibly. I don't think so, though. I'm pretty sure I played it on the 24th and after. You grind these games more than I do. I just dip in for a bit of recreation while I'm writing this book right now. Wait till I get back in the pool. You actually played me the other night, didn't you? So I was I like, did. I was just uh, like messing around and stuff. And then 
I, I think I like misclick min three bet you. You did. Yeah. Unless the better hand than very Just for bad. insult, you know. Yeah. What'd you have ace queen? No, I had nines. Yeah. Um but uh it was out of position, I think it was a suit board and And also you should never try and like play poker against your coach. You should just fold every hand, obviously. Uh, well next time I'll be four betting. <laughs> Uh, I think I get the light see about this. Uh, I expect them to lead all their aces. Given that yeah, I think three. it's fine. Like when you get checked to twice, like it should be okay. Uh, on the the bottom left, uh, I think this is close. Um, I could be wrong. Um, with the two players, they yeah, it's close. It's definitely player. close. Um, um, I think fold is good because I think it's very hard to realize your equity here. And on the top right, I think I might actually choose to bluff this because I blocked the eight nine. Yep. Go for it. Uh, and a lot of your range improves on that card as well. So Yeah, so uh, King Queen That's part uh, of your range you should follow through with. King Queen, um yeah. I think I can just flat. Yeah, I'd flat you don't seem to have any habitual okay, you got one guy in the small blind that's not ideal. He's got twelve bucks and can shove, but Yeah, and it's a good hand to see a flop with him because top pair is Absolutely. Goes very up valuable. Value. Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna point. fold this as part of my new I would open it, open it, open it, it's way too good. Like I know you've tightened your range, but if you fold that, you'll be opening like thirty percent, nope. like yeah. thirty less than thirty percent probably. And in the top left, I think I'm just going to take the free equity. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you're four away. Your fold equity is very limited. Bam! That's uh, how we roll. Good shot with a backdoor flush draw uh, and an over. Um, yeah, I think off, you can. I think you can see bet. Do you have a gut shot? Yeah, you do have a gut shot. Just kind of went a bit insane there. I would. I would just see bet. Like you don't have the showdown value to check call really. So. I would I'd delay C bet now for sure. Um yeah. Left. Uh I think I'm just gonna call. Yeah. Just um, delay your raising game to the river, leave it three way. Don't go while he's grassy out, let him sort of shove rivers and stuff. Not the best river, probably don't want to raise anymore, but clearly a call. Uh I I'm just gonna check the right. Yeah, okay. You got Ken yeah. high, I mean. I think if yeah. you bluff that combo you're bluffing like a lot on the river there and his range has just improved so he should be under bluffing anyway because he's going to underfold there naturally so uh, I think I just have to call yep just uh, a call just a call yeah that sucks uh, wow he's really just going to like slow play the nut flush there I guess that uh, makes sense actually guess, doesn't it I guess he takes if he raises I'm going to fold yeah uh, which I probably would fold if he rejumped like yeah he oh, yeah, you'd fold a straight but would you fold lesser oh, flushes oh. I'll probably, but I'd probably re-raise the worst flushes. Uh, so I guess I sure. like this. Yeah, I like it. I like this play a lot. Then um, I thought it was kind of strange, but it's not. It actually, makes a lot of sense. I tag that guy as a good reg. Actually, having seen that call, because yeah. a lot of regs so are stupid there, and we'll just raise. This uh, this guy is pretty aggro with his four bets. Uh, just flat then. Good. Well, what's the guy? Yeah, just flat then. That's a weaker player behind you with a non-full stack. So you don't want a three bet full king queen off against a guy that's going to four bet you. You don't really want a three bet call it or three bet shove it either. So just flat. Uh, and I'll be check calling. So what? How are you going to adjust to that guy then pre-flop? Like what hands? Are you what different hands that you would normally three bet? You're going to three bet jam in light of his. Um, like ace, ace, like ace x suited. Yeah, uh, would be a better a better hand three bet. Um, Ace Queen on the top right is probably just the top of my calling range, I think, against an unknown. Okay, uh, fair enough. Three bet. In um, the big blind, yeah, for sure. I think small blind, clear, clear three bet, but in the big blind, yeah, fine. And I don't see really any reason to, to bet. I think you I should. You need to value bet now. I don't think they ever have a 10 here. I think you can get called by one pair. I think you need to bet River. So just bet, just bet like 150, yeah. I mean, you're going to you're gonna bluff when you have eight high here, right? Yeah. So you're not value uh, bet two pairs. So good so often. Betting ends. Uh, I guess if he raises, I just have to fold. It's kind of weird if he raises, honestly. But yeah. yeah, I mean, I don't know what the hell he's doing. If you, I'm just so confused. If he raises, I just click call probably to be honest. So facing the late C bet with the ace queen. Um, um, I, I check. You could check raise here. <clears throat> giving that I block queen jack. Yeah, and I'd also like you've got some that. equity, and also like it's a good hand to just take the showdown. But then when he bets, you don't have showdown value anymore. So to check raise bluff, he snaps the turn. What does yeah. he snap turn with? Probably some kind of pair plus draw hand. I think so. Uh, and I Let's think follow that... through. You block the nuts. Like I think his turn calls way too fast to be <clears throat> a good hand, basically. So I like the big polarizing sizing. I think it's nice. One problem with it could be that he's just a fish because of his turn timing. Yeah. That could be one potentiality that's not good for us there, but... Yeah, it's probably okay. 
There's a lot of purple draw in his range, certainly, so I think following through with that particular combo makes sense with the blocker. Um, so I'm going to flat the ace 10. Yeah, for sure. To the true bet. Um, I might actually float the slope. That's close. Uh, I think sorry? you probably can, yeah. Uh, given that he's, he's checked uh, and it's it's actually eight seven three, um, I think we can just bet and he's going to fold a lot. Yeah, I think like, we'll just go with our population read here that they're not check calling this texture very much and we'll just over bluff. We probably have to check ace high here if we we're playing balanced. I might yeah. be a bit bigger just to discourage him check calling me with like ace jack and stuff like that if he's going to check fold. I don't know. So the the day if he does check call, uh, I do think I'd fall equity on future streets against them better aces. Yeah, true, uh, true. So, uh, I'm not too afraid. It's more. Uh, this is a, that's actually pretty. That's bad a great. Card. That's a great card because a lot of your range has just improved there. So you should now definitely bluff turn with this part of it because every queen x that you stab flop with, which is quite a lot yeah. of your range, improved. So you should bet yeah. all your queens here and your your air as well. Then on the river, you can just decide whether you how wide you want to you want to bluff river. I just revert to a balance strategy because I don't know how how wide this guy's likely to call me down on the river. So I would probably just revert to balance here on the river, just bluff somewhere around. You know, if you're bluffing for, as a shove, it's going to be about pot size, so just bluff a third of your range. Bluff uh, 2 to 1 value to bluff ratio. And that would probably mean that you check ace 10 on the river, to be honest. I'm going to, I sort of think, I'm going to go here with ace 8 too. I only have one person up behind me, and I hope okay. we have position, uh, which is a spot we want to be in, and it's going to follow the lines to the double barrel um, against the hijack. Um, Sorry guys, I was just checking the time there so I know how how long to record for. We'll do another sort of five ten minutes. So I flop. Top pair, but it blocked some of his draws as well. So I think checking back is okay here. Um, I don't block any diamonds, but um, it's not a flop. I'll be thrilled about if I get raised on either. So. Uh, I think I say yeah. I think against like the fish, you can play. Yeah, uh, you can you can play uh, exploitative the strategy there. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So I'm I'm just gonna bet uh, and then redecide on the whatever depending on the river. So he snap called again. Um. I think I'm gonna call this lead. Um. Yeah. I'm not really sure what he's leading with. That's better. Like ace jack. I mean, he can randomly show up with like a flush and stuff or ace jack or some slow played thing, but like. You only need twenty five percent equity. He's a fish. Don't fold. Like that's it. Yeah. Like, you will lose here a fair bit actually, but not like enough to fold probably. What do you have? Queen jack of diamonds. Yeah. Well, queen jack with a diamonds. So with one diamond. So oh right, right. So we won. Jack okay. her, um, which was interesting. Um, I guess this play doesn't make any sense, but he's a fish. So and why would you expect it to? Right. Yeah. Sorry about the technical difficulties there, guys. I'm having a bit of trouble with my computer like coping with all these things going on. It should cope in theory as it's like a powerful iMac, but it seems to be like, or maybe it's internet connection, just doesn't like it, I'm recording. And yeah, so on the bottom left, this guy is definitely a fish, and I think if I true bet, it sucks if he four bets. Yeah, um, definitely just flat, yeah. Yeah, and I have position, and he's after checking. I think I have enough shot in value to check back this part, I think. Yeah, I against will. the fish as well. Fish is more likely just to slow play like the nuts here or, or an over pair for no reason. So your so hand is not good as often as it would be against a reg check, I don't think. Yeah, and I think I have a lot of showdown value now with ASI on yeah, the double pair sure. draw. And um, a flush draw, so yeah. Clear call. Yeah, and that would be a call again on the eight river. On the um, eight diamonds, for sure. Um, yeah, no real good. reason not to. Like, if he's slow played a 10, so be it. Yep, um, absolutely. Yeah, so he had an eight. Um, the usual nonsense fish depolarized river bet that's neither value or a bluff it's just is what it is like loads of sense yep um, uh, sorry about the beeping as well if that's pissing anyone off like we'll probably turn your sound off next time but I forgot to say so that's my bad uh, so queen jack suited on the bottom left against the fish I'm just going to go ahead and see about it for yep. value um, How would you play that hand against the reg? Would you check all? Yeah, I think this one, or it, it's it's. I think I'm I'm torn in between check calling my weaker top pairs or my better top pairs to block the sort of over pairs. Uh, and I think uh, I'm gonna start favoring checking the, the better top pairs that block the over pairs because there's just less to be afraid of. Um, That's true, but also I, I wouldn't. I would bet the 
I would check the weaker ones because it's not just about that. It's about three streets of value. And with Ace Jack there, you can bet three times, but you can't bet three times with Queen Jack. Therefore, Ace Jack's much better to bet flop with. I would favor oh, that so, argument. Yeah. So the so Queen Jack, I don't think they can get three streets of value from betting. Uh, this guy bet really small on the turn, um, and he snapped Jack's back the river. Yeah. Uh, so Queen Jack is is obviously too too weak to be betting three streets, and he turned yeah. his set to a bluff on the turn. Yeah. Uh, it's going to fall the sevens out of position to the net. Um, He's 10-2. Yeah, fair yeah. enough. Um, and I'm going to call Ice 5 suit. Yep. Um, so Queen Jack, it does block the over, which is a plus, but it's not good enough for three streets of value. So like Queen Jack is probably better, and then King Jack would probably be close. I don't think King Jack is strong enough to three, three streets of value, though, with just the top pair. Yeah, um, well, if you don't turn the two pair, obviously, yeah. Yeah, uh, so Ice Jack suited in the small blind is uh, a good candidate to true bet. Yep. Um, can see how he's he's like dealing with three tables here, guys. Like this is just the result of practice. Like Rory's played a lot of zoom, a lot of volume, and your thought process just speeds up when you get to that level. So for any of you guys watching this who'd normally like play two tables at regular because you're newer players, you will get to this point that you can do this as well. But don't I don't recommend playing this high volume right away because um, it's fast yeah. thinking. So on top left, uh, I think it's worth considering a bluff here. Um, I think a lot of his king x hands should have been barreling the turn to be honest uh, like a lot of them will have like king queen ace king a lot of these uh, hands yeah I think you're going to see like a lot of like nines and jack x here and stuff and you don't have that much air you do have some air here in this run out but not loads when there's like two like the ten and the king hit your club draws a good bit yeah. so you don't have like loads of air here or anything um, so I would probably bet a bit smaller because of that I don't think you need to bet so big because you don't have like heaps of air uh, to show the nitty nature of the, the players at this pool here. Yeah, they're just like afraid to. Th they really don't get enough value. That's one thing. They don't value bet thin enough. That's definitely true. They are just nits, <laughs> to be honest. He did hit his two hour though. I'm annoyed about that. But, uh, so tens would be a easy enough you know, flat. I'm going to fold the Jack 10 suit out of position to cool. a true bet. Um, And I'll be falling to that seed bet. Yep. No club, no real need to uh, do anything. Uh, so this is a, another uh, format that coaching can take where we do a, a ghosting session. The student talks through exactly like Roy's doing this really well because he's talking through everything he's doing. I'll have some students that will be doing a lesson. They'll be like, what should I do? What should I do? What should I do? In every spot. And that's not useful because you want them to you want the student to sort of talk about what they're doing first so you can then get feedback so they can practice their thought process with supervision. It's like driving lessons. Like you drive and the instructor gives you feedback. You don't just like ask what to do at every single juncture. So I'm just going to give up with the trees um, on this texture and all easy fold on the river. Um, I probably should have just checked back flop. Yeah, I don't uh, like the sea bet. Mm -hmm. I was going to uh, say thinking about it more and add a position to the reg and um, he should have but I think this this is an, is an okay board for him and he's going to be flopping me a lot so. yeah I would check folds this flop with this hand yeah uh, and he snap checks back queen uh, high is probably a decent enough like yeah, having that overcard to the 10 is probably decent enough to like make a delayed c bet here instead yeah. of like a double delayed c bet probably I think I'd like a delayed c bet here your 10x has also just improved as well like your range is not super weak there by any means. So I like it. Right, we're going to wrap up. Um, hit set out next hand, and then we'll... Normally I'd say set out next blind, but if you don't mind setting out next... It's up to you, actually. But I'll just do next hand. Okay, right. cool. If you don't mind. Um, so I did click that, didn't I? I don't know why that one started again. Um, so I've got a fish flat in the uh, small blind mm -hmm. uh, I'm just not going to bluff him uh, no. like jack 10 5 it's like he, nearly every hand he has has some sort of draw yeah so he's just never going away he's got high equity against us let's just hope the board runs out good and we get the showdown and win basically yeah or it comes a tree and I get to stack him that would be nice that would be good yeah but uh, no uh, the 6 is on the queen a5 Um Again, like a lot of his hands have sort of draws, and he's going to be calling me a lot. Yeah. Uh, so I think checking back is just fine. Yep. Uh, with this oh, part of your range, yeah. I think you can call turn fold river as well with this hand. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think I'm just going to check back again. Uh, I don't yeah. Know. We could get some value from ace highs, I guess. 
Um, we can bet River if it checks three times. So just, just go um, within here. I bet River here, like just small, like half ball. Yeah, I think we have the best hand just super often. We can get called by A side. We get called by like pocket fours or something. So he did have uh, oh, a side. Yeah, ace, ace four. So. Good. All right, good job. Um, good exemplary session. That's how it's done when you're playing a live ghosting session with your coach, talking loads. Good job, man. Um, we'll do some more. Check in with you again in a few weeks in a later episode of How to Master Six Max Zoom. Thanks for coming on to the Grinder School series for us, and we'll see you again, yeah? Yeah, no problem. All right, nice. Okay, guys, let me know what you think. Questions, comments about this format. You want some coaching? like Rory has done, then go ahead and hit me up at admin at carrotcorner.com with an email or check out the site carrotcorner.com for our coaching prices and packages. And Hopefully that gives you a good flavour though of what to expect. And on with the series, probably be back in the classroom doing a bit more theory um, next week and maybe a bit more live play from me. So see you guys then.